Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to the episode of Pat Taste Performance. Today in the driveway, we finally tackle this free Craftsman Platinum 190cc 3000 PSI pressure washer that I received for free. I ended up preparing a, another pressure washer for a lady, and she was very ecstatic with my honesty, turnaround, and price that she decided to drop off her old one to me at no charge. As you guys can see, it is, is in pieces. According to her, she lent it out to um, a family member, and this is how they returned it back to her. So, originally she was going to have me repair this, uh, but then her other pressure washer decided not to work, and she chose this instead. In the end, it's a win-win situation for all of us. She got a working pressure washer. I got a repair, a video out of that, and I got this as well. So, in order to figure out the root cause of why this machine ended up here and at this state, is we have to put it back together and go from there. If you guys are wondering, I am doing a voiceover. I have no idea what happened to my microphone. I don't know if it, uh, if I forgot to turn it on or whatever. So anyhow, I was showing you guys the exhaust gaskets before. Um, I do know that is an exhaust gasket because I have done some work uh, on this engine. It is similar, unfortunately, to my Toro Time Master. Yes, it's absolutely disgusting and mind blowing. The same engine on a pressure washer is the same engine that powers my dual bladed 30 inch self propelled electric start lawnmower. As we all know, as long as I have that lawnmower, I will cry about it. It is severely underpowered. Anyhow, uh, in order to make this thing easier to move around, I am putting the handles back on, which she used to hold the gaskets, which she probably had no idea, uh, you know, what those are for. Um, I'm not sure if she decided to take it apart or the individual she lent it to, you know, decided to take it apart for, you know, whatever reason, you know, it may be. So we're kind of playing a uh, small engine detective, per se, to figure out, you know, you know, just, just how it came to the state. I mean, this is a beautiful machine. Part of me is like 50-50 if I, if I want to fix this or not because... That gas tank would work on my Time Master and that would solve my fuel leak issue with the uh, spin-on cap. The Time Master has a quick spin cap and that is prone to leak and to fix it is literally $90 for a new tank and cap. Absolutely ridiculous. And I could use that frame, which is pretty damn cool, to be my new mobile oil change uh, platform that I use for all my small engines. Alright guys, let's dive into the uh, troubled area first. <clears throat> This muffler assembly is loose from the shield to the exhaust housing itself. So we're going to be removing the 5 16 screw and hopefully free up this muffler and we can get inside the bolts. Um, usually there's a series of two or three. Like I said, this is going to be in pieces just that one. And also, where that rust part is, that is your ID tag for the muffler. Obviously, if we get this thing working, I'm going to clean it up and paint it. Now, looking at the exhaust, that is, um, basically, there's a spring actuated temp sensor on there. As the exhaust gets hot, that spring opens up the choke and gives the machine full power. As you can see here, look at that right side. That has been either wallowed or hollowed out, um, either from being loose and rubbing, but... That is giving us a little bit of insight of what happened to this machine. And there I am taking off the other bolt to um, so the exhaust housing. Obviously there were no bolts holding that exhaust on. Just the bolt for the exhaust housing was holding the whole entire assembly on. All right, so now we take a step back, rethink. And look at those exhaust bolts. Rusty crusty, and they actually see a little bit pieces of aluminum in there. 
they potentially could be stripped. So what I want to do is clean them up. And I'm also thinking that inside, thinking, I know inside there, where the actual bolts go through, those are stripped as well. That's where that aluminum is from. And here I am, just confirming my suspicions. I'm actually going to try and start them in the machine. Now we're going to do the one closest to the machine first. Um, on the bottom, that bolt didn't seem to be hollowed out. That one turned in. Um, it wouldn't go in all the way. And it honestly felt stripped. But sometimes if you can get it to catch just a little bit, you know, you're good to go. Next part is we went on the, uh, the right side. And that was tight. So that was good to go. The only thing that's good about the tight side is that we could pass the nut all the way through. Here is my Snap-on re-threading kit. The missus knows when she comes out, if she sees this and a few other to few tools out there, do not bother me. This kit is worth its weight in gold. I'm almost positive Hanson rebrands this, but the reason why I went with Snap-on is too, it's a lifetime guarantee. And when you're in the line, if you're in the line of work that I am, stuff like that is very important. This tool will pay for itself instantly and last me a lifetime as well. So what I like to do to measure that I'm using the correct tool for, you know, the pitch and the thread, what I like to do is I like to match it up. Once I match up the threads and I can find out the correct um, re-threading tool I need and go from there. Everything is labeled. It's pretty simple and easy. Um, this is one of those tools where, you know, the correct tool for the job will make it so much easier and extremely rewarding. So here we are. We are putting this back together and we're going to clean up those threads inside. We're not tapping them. We are trying to just clean them up. So, of course, when you try and clean up anything that involves metal on metal, a little bit of lube goes a long way. So, like I said, we're just re-threading. We are not re-tapping. We are trying to restore the existing threads that are there. Because there's a possibility that <clears throat> even though the threads are stripped, per se, there still could be enough good metal to reconfigure them to OEM spec. Remember, when you always wanna try and repair something, you wanna try and repair it to as close as factory or improved from the factory. You never wanna go below. We've seen backwards repairs. So I gave it a little tap, I started by hand, and now I'm just using my ratchet to, uh, to tighten it down. And you know, like I said, it's gonna be metal on metal, so there's gonna be some force that, that's needed um, don't be afraid you're not going to break or snap anything. Uh, like I said, you're just restoring. If you're tapping something, that's a completely different story. So here I am. You see I need a little bit of force to get it in, which is fantastic. And then on the way out, I could actually uh, I start to do it by hand. That's perfect. That's a really good sign. See that? Now I'm doing it by hand. That means those threads are absolutely perfect and exactly where they need to be. That's when you know you do a good job. So here we are, we're gonna be working on the second hole. And that hole I have trouble, you know, getting all the way in. You know, for some reason, look at that. You tap, put it all the way in by hand, and here I am using my ratchet, and that's when I find out that this is basically bottomed out, but this actually is part of the block. That is something you do not want to crack or break because uh, it could be a junk motor. Where are you going to have to have that welded up? So you won't want to make a simple job a real difficult job. Okay, next are these bolts. They are stripped slash have old material in them, the aluminum. 
So here we're just taking the thread chaser and we're just going to chase it down. We are not re-threading. We are just cleaning. Start it, like I said, let it go up just a little bit, and as you guys see, this is where I'm going to spread my lube, because the lube will trickle down through the threads, down the bolt, in there, and that'll increase our chances, reduce the heat, and reduce anything from breaking. Remember that. Metal on metal yields heat. Heat, to a certain extent, will cause something to snap and break. You do not want to do that. This happens to just be a half inch that I'm using to do it. Um, if you do another kit, you know, that's a different story. But, you know, if you use the Snap-on slash Hanson kit, that's where you're likely doing. So here I am. I'm working it up and I'm working it down. When I always chase and repair threads, the guy, the goal is to thread it on and off by hand. If you can do that on and off by hand, then you know those threads are absolutely perfect there's no rust there's no material built up in between that is my goal i absolutely love that feeling i think it's nice and easier that way compared to just trying to fight it all the way in and all the way out and you, when if you have things nice and smooth if you start feeling a little bit of tension you know you're coming at the end of something or that there's a problem that's going to arise so since that one's cleaned up nicey nice on to the next one So just getting it nice and tight in the vise. Something like this, whenever you're tapping or threading, you definitely want to do this on a solid surface. You definitely do not want no movement to increase your chances of success. Because this is, I really hate, this is mostly, this is kind of precision. You know, you don't want to have anything, you know, loose when you're trying to do something like this. Like I said, you don't want to turn an easy job into a complicated job. And you see how that's, not even, so we have to back that up a little bit and try and start all over again. Now, if this has been completely destroyed, that re-thread will restore and put it back to the factory settings. And you can see, you can see that we're going through our problematic areas, and the chase and the chaser is working through it. And then we're just going round and round. See, we bottom down, that's a good thing. Success, success. So, like I said, back it off nice and easy. That's the goal. And once we know that happens, those threads are absolutely perfect and exactly where they need to be from when they were first installed. And here I am just confirming it up and down. Absolutely perfection. This is exactly what you want to achieve. All right, now it's time to see if re-chasing and repairing the existing threads will work. Now I am throwing on the gaskets. Remember, it came with four gaskets. I'm thinking that the original gaskets split. So it's just pretty simple. One on each side, or in this case, two and two on each side. It does not matter the order that they go in. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking the existing hardware that I just rechased and rethreaded. Make sure they screw in before I slap them on the muffler and putting them in. I am just confirming. So as you guys can see, the right side with the exhaust side, that gets tight. Um, the one on the left side just felt a little bit loose. I couldn't feel like I was bottoming out to the sense I was getting a nice tight grip. But what I was thinking is that if one side was tight, and the other one, if I get in that right spot, this could be a quick, easy repair. Now, why am I not using Threadlocker? It's very, very good. Um, one of the ways to remove a hardware with Threadlocker in it is heat. So using exhaust, it's going to be almost useless. Over time, that exhaust is going to heat up that Threadlocker, and those bolts are going to back up. So that's not... A long-term repair. The goal is for a long-term repair. Here I am using ANTCs, obviously. Metal on metal. Um, I've had quite a number of exhaust studs snap on me. 
definitely a good measure if you're going to keep the machine or not. Just get into the good habit of using that. Okay, and that is the hold down clip for the hardware. Once we get those bolts nice and tight, we're going to bend those flaps over to make sure those bolts never back out again. I'm installing the hardware back in the muffler. Uh, we're going to start to line everything up. It's a little bit tricky, but you just have to be patient. So obviously I'm installing everything on the muffler, and you're just going to have to line it all up. Whichever one catches first, use your hands. Do not, do not use any sort of battery-powered or air-powered tool. Line it up and twist it by hand. And here I am, I'm trying to eyeball it. Uh, because like I said, you could see that first one closest to you and towards the machine. Once I lock that in, then I know I can line up the, uh, the second one furthest away. And uh, what I like to do is I like to always get the hardest one first and then do the easiest one last. All right, so we got the bolts in. A um, little bit of sketchy, a little bit of sketch. One of them was a little loose. Uh, but I thought if we catch it on the right thread and we bend this flap over, that would stop the exhaust bolts from backing out. Doesn't hurt to try, right? Fail stands for first attempt and learning. So here I am just knocking this flap over, making sure that hopefully these threads will not, I'm sorry, these exhaust bolts will not back out. And as you guys can see, I'm just twisting the nuts to make sure they're nice and tight. That right one is giving me a little bit of a problem, but we shall see. Only time will tell is once we start to experiment and put everything on all together. And as you guys can see from that flapping around, look, it started melting the plastic engine cowling. So the next thing we're going to do, I'm going to make an executive decision is... Since there is no gas in the machine, um, why not clean the carburetor? Might as well just know we're starting with a good, clean slate. Often I find in equipment is that if machines break in middle operation or just in general, a lot of people, they don't drain the gas. They're just like, oh, screw this, you know what, and uh, you know, leave it. And gas evaporates away, but stuff in the bolt will rot it out. So here I am, I think I'm just using either 5 16 or 8 millimeters, same thing. Pulling off that uh, air intake filter housing, and we're exposing the carburetor. God, this is, looks so much familiar to my time master. It's very disheartening. Uh, there is our kill switch that's on and off. We're going to remove those wires. They only go on one way. So if you put them back on a roll, and off is on and on is off, just flip them and you're good to go. So as you guys can see, take note of the carburetor, how it's laid out. Okay, that spring in the front is actually built into the carburetor. You don't have to worry about that. That spring in the back, that is actually your governor adjustment. Take note of that. So I'm just using a simple set of pliers. We are backing off the hose clamp for the fuel line. Come on, here we go. Give that hose just a little bit of a twist and a pull to break that seal and it will come right out like so. And wow, you can see a little bit of buildup underneath the fuel line. So here I am just looking at the governor spring, seeing where the exit hole is for that and nice and easy out it goes do not stretch do not stretch that and now it's time to take off those carb studs those are the same exact size which is pretty interesting usually they're two different sizes the same size for the intake filter same size for the car i like that now this carburetor will come off nice and easy Oh, didn't have one out all the way. Okay, and don't forget, 
Part of that kill switch wire is grounded between the carburetor and the motor. Do not forget that. All right, so now I'm gonna get a carburetor out. I think it's first, it's easier to take off um, governor spring. As you guys can see, I'm, I'm unhooking it first, going towards the machine. Now I'm tilting it out towards me, and we are free from the choke linkage. Now, here we are, carburetor upside down. That should be a 13 millimeter or a half inch. We're gonna break that bowl free. We're gonna get a good look inside this carburetor. Let's see if our suspicions have paid off or it's really nice and clean inside. So, it's nice and clean. The jets don't get clogged, and look inside there. Wow. So I guess looks can be deceiving. But anyway, while we're here, why not? It's just almost like we are taking a precautionary step. Like I said, if we were to do this full of gasoline, then we'd have gas spilling all over the place. And since it's nice and dry, we do not have to worry about that. I'm just blasting some brake cleaner down the idle uh, between the jets. Once and I get a steady stream flow, we know we are good to go. And we're just doing the same thing here, pulling out the, the needle for the float. Float comes out, the pin for the float. The needle comes out too. Like I said, everything is nice and clean inside, but while it's all apart, might as well. You just never know, never know. So just going through every hole, and once I know I'm getting a stream, because, you know, that carburetor, it flows in and out. So if you're going to spray through one hole, it's got to come out another hole. Time to put it all back together. Uh, sitting the float in with the needle. I'm going to stick our pin in. Uh, this thing was pretty clean inside, so everything should go together just as easy as it all came apart. I'm gonna put that nut. I always hate it. I always hate that. I'm gonna put something down. I forget where I put it. it. Happens more often than I want to admit. Then again, I'm just working what I got. My fancy workbench is the tailgate of Mandingo. So putting that jet back on, remember as you guys can see, again, it's carburetor, it's aluminum, brass jet, starting it by hand. Once I know what got it locked in, I will be using my ratchet to put it down. No electrical tool needed. Do not want to strip it out. Here we are back again. We're going to line this back up. Make sure everything is good. Even though it's in pieces, um, it's going to be just fine. Take note of those two half moons on each side. Those is how you know that that is seated correctly against that exhaust manifold gasket. All right, time to put the carburetor back on. You have to make sure that everything is all lined up. What I like to do is assemble that metal shroud first and have it lined up. And here we are, we're doing the exhaust temp choke throttle first, and then from there, the governor. Okay. Don't mind, do not do that gasket. That gasket was a very bad move by me. Um, because I'm not too familiar with these engines, I thought that that gasket was missing. I thought someone else had been in here. You do not need to put a gasket in there. Like I said before, that comment, those tits on the engine line up with that. I ended up having a no start 
But when I got it started, with were on the rough issues. It was getting in air. And that was because of that gasket I put in there. Do not put that in there. There is no gasket. That rubber piece, that plastic piece with the red gasket, that is your gasket. It passes through that metal piece, through those tits, and it seals right to the carburetor. Tightening the bolts down. Here at the home stretch, as you guys notice, I did them by hand. Now I'm just using the ratchet to run it down, and we are good to go. I think that ratchet goes up to 35 foot pounds, more than enough than necessary. Now I'm blowing through the fuel line to confirm that there it's it's not clogged, and uh, spit out some uh, little residual nastiness I got in there. Time for the intake manifold. It's pretty straightforward. Don't forget we have to hook up those kill switch first. Because it's been so long, I do not remember which wire goes where, but like I said, take a note when you do it yourself. I have a feeling um, black on the bottom and red on top. That is our governor spring. So let's hook that back up. It's very easy to show where it goes. One tiny little hole. All right, so I'm just trying to get a close-up shot show you how the linkages are set up and where that spring goes. It's pretty straightforward. Just in case you guys were asking, there's your visual enhancement. Take notes of where that spring goes. Um, like I said, very easy to identify. Now it's time to put on the intake manifold slash air filter housing. You're literally at the home stretch to see, um, you know, what other issues arise once we get it started. Now, I did mention I did do myself dirty by trying to think outside the box and put a gasket in there. Nonetheless, that is not the machine's skeleton in the closet. You guys already have a rough idea of what the skeleton in the closet may be. We have crows its paths. We will see if our rethreading has paid off or not. I have a feeling this might be a common issue. All right, guys, now it's time to verify that this machine works. Um, hopefully, okay, we are going to throw Throw a Lucas oil treatment in there. It is their equivalent to sea foam. Henry at Mowers and Blowers was grateful enough to give this to me. I ran out of sea foam due to COVID. I had no interest in going out and getting some. So um, whether this works or not is going to be up to you. Uh, I'm going to have another video out on this, and you guys can make your own decision. Um, so I run dual treated fuel. I always run fresh fuel with stabilizer in there, and then I run a seafoam or the Lucas oil variant in there to make sure that it also doubles up as a cleaning agent, and that is also a stabilizing agent as well. We are going to be hooking up the water. You never want to hook up your pressure washer with uh, no water running through. It's a good way to burn out your pump and destroy your machine. Um, sometimes, most of the times, the value of the pump exceeds the value of the machine. And they're also going to be hooking up the hose too. Remember, this thing we have no idea what works, what does, and what leaks, what does not. In the meantime, I'd like to take uh, the time of this video to apologize that my microphone malfunctioned. And uh, I'm thankful that you guys held in for that this long. This is going to be a two-part series because the second part of this video um, will be with the proper setup and everything is working. So this is not my style of video, but I didn't want to delete this footage because I feel that this is important. So here we are hooking up the hose. Okay, like I said, you want to verify if anything is leaking from the hose up because then we can further evaluate whether this machine is worth to continue to fix or no good. Remember, when you fix and flip, whether it's free or not, you need to think about all things considered. A pump, I'm sorry, a hose 
gun and tip kit, because this isn't missing, it's missing some tips, is around 50 bucks, give or take a little. So that's a, that's a pretty penny for a, for a part. And that, and that hose will fit most of your pressure washers. So they either your cheap $100 units up to a unit like this, is, which is like $250, $300, you're taking $50 right off the top from your, uh, your paycheck. So here I am, I'm bleeding out the air. That's also very important too as well. You wanna make sure all the air is out of the pump. That's a good way to lock up your pump and your engine. Um, if that ever happens, just hold the trigger, get all the air out, and you're good to go. So here I am pulling it. Uh, one, two, three. I could start feeling a little tense. Four, five, six. Ooh, now it's getting hard. You see that? Now watch this. Squeeze the gun. Look at this pressure. Boom. That's air. That's pressure. Let's get that all out, and boom, fires right up. Look at that muffler. Right? Let's look at the negative. That muffler is shaking, so we know our, our repair didn't go through. But look, the hose is working, the engine's running, the pump is functioning. This is fantastic. So with that being said, guys, if you guys found this video helpful, smash the like button, smash the subscribe button. Guess what? I'll see you guys on part two on the next episode of Pat Tay's Performance. And don't forget the Mrs. and I will go live Saturday morning, every Saturday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. All right, guys. Later.